this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's fabulous phablet day again. But this is not one of those really expensive high-end phablets. This is one that a lot of people can afford. $299, no contract required. It's sold on lock, so you can use a T-Mobile or AT&T SIM in the United States, or a variety of SIMs overseas as well. This is the Huawei Ascend Mate 2. Not the easiest name to say, a brand some of you are probably familiar with, those of you who are really into phones, but they're the ODM, our original device manufacturer, for quite a few phones in the United States, but they're going forward with their own brand now, trying to get a little notice. We're going to look at it now. So those of you who watch our videos know that I actually have pretty large hands, despite the fact that I'm a woman. And this still looks like quite the handful, doesn't it? This is the Huawei Ascend Mate 2. It has a 6.1 inch display. It's a pretty nice looking display, even if the resolution on paper doesn't look that impressive. Remember, this is $299 without any contract or subsidy, so don't expect everything to be high end on this guy. 1280 by 720 IPS display, high glove sensitivity option, good viewing angles, nice enough looking display. Yeah, it's 240 PPI, so that's not record breaking. It's not like the Samsung Galaxy S5. You're not talking about 440 PPI, but it actually is a pretty nice looking display here. Runs Android 4.3, not 4.4. That's kind of an embarrassing little fact there, I think. But Huawei does say that they will be coming out with a 4.4 update to KitKat. They don't have a timetable yet, so we don't know uh, when that will be. It runs what they call their Emotion UI 2.0 Lite. Well, there's a lot of words there, but you can see that they do mess around with the look and feel a bit. We've got these kind of squared off icons. Reminds me of Motorola Android smartphones of old a little bit. And you have the, this thing here. We also saw this on a Lenovo tablet recently, and I think this is to be more friendly maybe to uh, iOS converts. There's no little home button. Notice that, you know, where you just bring, bring up the app drawer. Instead, you swipe sideways, and there's your app drawer. A little weird, but that's the way that is. More blank home screens there. You can press and hold, and you see you can control your widgets, your wallpapers, your transitions, thumbnails, swipe home, edit home, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, for those of you who think that that's repulsive, I can understand that. You can use third-party launchers. There's plenty of third-party launchers that can replace this look if you don't like it and you like everything else about the phone. And Honestly, I think most folks who buy unlocked phones these days, not through a carrier, are probably more power users who are familiar with the fact that you can use replacement launchers and make things look the way you like. Since this is a 6.1 inch phone, that puts it seriously in phablet territory. It is not a bad looking phone. It is not impossible to hold a one-handed operation, even with my pretty big hands. You can do some things with it. I could swipe to unlock, for example. I can activate things right there. There is a one-handed option that kind of shifts things off to a side to make things a little bit easier for you, but I'm not going to make jokes about big phones. If you want a phablet or a big phone, you know who you are. Some folks do, some folks don't. That's up to you. I will say that this will look big holding it up against your face unless you have a really, really large face. You get the idea. It's up there with the Samsung Galaxy Mega Android phones, and that's really what it competes with, because those are kind of mid-spec, mid-range phones as well, and the idea is with this, you can get the same thing for, well, significantly less money. That's something that Huawei has been good at. Like I said, they have made other devices that U.S. carriers offer, and usually it gets changed to a different brand name, perhaps the carrier's own brand name, so they're trying to break out and actually offer things under their own brand name in the United States. Over in China, they're certainly big business there and they're a pretty respected manufacturer they're not some little no-name guy they're really really large company they may be actually in the top three worldwide for those who actually manufacture smartphones if it looks a lot like the samsung galaxy note to an almost embarrassing degree well yes you're right it does indeed let's bring out the note 3 so you can see them together so here they are together golly gee doesn't that look like they were separated not long after birth mm. So we don't give Huawei a huge credit for a lot of originality here. By the way, this, the phone's available in your choice of white or black. You don't have to get it in white. And our Note 3 here, of course, has a somewhat smaller display, so it is a little bit smaller. But you can see the 6.1-inch Senmei 2 isn't that much more humongous, especially when you're getting big past a certain point. You know, what's another centimeter among friends, shall we say? The design is also pretty pleasing on it. It has fairly slim side bezels. The top and bottom bezels are not too big. Again, it's pretty similar to the Note. And if we turn them over and look at the back, the Note, of course, goes with the faux leather here for the Note 3. The previous generation Note had the shiny plasticky back. 
Huawei does have the shiny plasticky back here. The nice thing about it is, well, white usually doesn't show fingerprints as much as black, but it, it, despite the fact that it is shiny plastic, it doesn't show fingerprints all that much. It's not a bad looking phone. Certainly it's not stunningly original, but that is what it is. And there's some interesting little design curves here on the back where it's thin, but we have the little curve to the back that follows the headphone jack, which is up top here. And along the side, there's a little grab point where you can take off the back cover. And if you do that, behind door number one, you'll see not a removable battery. It's one of those designs where the back cover comes off. We've seen that before, but the battery does not come out. 3,900 milliamp battery, and that's humongous, especially given what's inside this phone. It doesn't need all that much horsepower. Got a big one watt speaker there. Pretty loud. Micro SIM card slot. Again, this will work with AT&T and T-Mobile US LTE 4G. So that makes it pretty cool. A lot of unlocked phones, you only get 3G HSPA. Here you actually get LTE. And right now we have an AT&T SIM in it. And there's a micro SD card slot there as well. So that's what you have access to when you take off the back, which again is a lot like a Samsung back. It's pretty thin. It's flexible. It probably will never break actually, but it is very flexible and thin. And it just snaps back on. It's pretty easy to do that. So it's not that annoying that to get to your micro SD card slot, you have to take that off. On the bottom offset here, we have a USB port, micro USB 2.0, microphone hole right there. And power button is over here. They moved it down because they figured this is a big phone. If you're using this one handed, certainly you wouldn't want the button up top or top top of the phone or even up top of this side right here. So there it is right there. There's your volume controls. The back has a 13 megapixel camera. That's a pretty good spec, especially for a phone that's selling for $299. And that is a Sony sensor in there. A lot of uh, top tier phones actually use Sony cameras inside, Sony sensors. 13 megapixel, for example, the last generation Samsung Galaxy S5. There's an LED flash right here. There's our speaker grill down at the bottom. Top here we have our earpiece and we have a 5 megapixel front camera, fairly wide angle lens. That's an unusually high resolution camera up there. And yeah, it does actually do a better than average job as a result. Now on the bottom, there are no hardware buttons or capacitive buttons. This is uses on-screen buttons only. As you can see, as we're zooming in on the display, the quality really isn't bad at all. We'll look at what a website looks like. By the way, you get Chrome web browser here. You get the internet web browser as well. And there's our WebKit test, which doesn't tend to have the prettiest fonts of anything, but you can see it's very sharp. It's very easy to read. And you can see our results for the SunSpider JavaScript test. 1417, not the most impressive number where lower numbers are better. Uh, more like a last generation phone. This is running on the Qualcomm Snapdragon 400. It's the quad core version of that CPU clocked at 1.6 gigahertz with Adreno 305 graphics. And for those of you who are CPU geeks, that would be the MSM8928. This has two gigs of RAM. That's pretty good, again, for a mid-range phone. 16 gigs of internal storage, about 12 and a half, 13 gigs free. It does have separate partitions, the way it's set up for application storage versus general file multimedia kind of storage. So there's about six gigs free for application storage. I'm not a fan of having segregated storage there, but that is the way it is set up. And for an almost comical shot right here. We have it next to the iPhone 5S with a four inch display. So for those of you who do have iPhones and you're wondering what the difference would be like, that gives you an idea. And let's do the magic swap here. We have the Samsung Galaxy S5 with its 5.1 inch display, which is one of the most petite of the five inch class phones. So you can see the difference in size there. It's obviously different, but it's not obscenely different. How about other specs? Inside this phone we have dual band Wi-Fi 802.11ac, Bluetooth 4.0, no NFC, we do have a GPS with GLONASS, so standalone GPS in there, and the screen is protected by Gorilla Glass 3, which is always heartening, especially when you have a big plate of glass to worry about. In terms of synthetic benchmark performance, it scores kind of like a mid-range phone does score, so nothing surprising there. Quadrant, 10,955. That's about half, a little bit better than half of what the top flagships will score with the Snapdragon 800 or 801. On Tutu, 20,839. For 3D Mark, the graphics benchmark, Ice Storm Unlimited Test, 4795. 
and you saw what the Sun Spider JavaScript test was. So again, you get mid-range performance here, but honestly, most people are not really going to notice the difference between this and a flagship phone in everyday use. The, the UI is fast and responsive. That's plenty enough power to do everything you want to do, including play full HD video. 4K, not as much, but what would be the point? on a screen this size, even if you have use the wireless display feature or something like that when KitKat comes out. How many of us have 4K displays we're going to be throwing our content to from our phones? This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today so we're here we are, Samsung video Galaxy playback test. Tab S, the 8.4 inch version. There's also a 10.5 inch version in a very... So the speaker set a two-thirds volume there. Obviously a big screen, a lot of fun for watching video. I'd love to show you the hottest new movie trailer, but YouTube uh, rules don't allow us to do that kind of thing, so I get to show you myself all over again there. But really very nice experience, can handle up to full HD video. This is the built-in one-watt speaker on the back, not too bad at all. Of course, you have a headphone jack that's perfectly adequate as well. Nice thing about this phone having just a mid-range CPU and not a super-duper high-resolution display. It doesn't require a whole lot of battery power. So that 3,900 milliamp battery, which is one of the largest you're ever going to find in a phone so far, means that this thing will just run and run. Even on LTE, which is what we're using right here right now, and mixed with Wi-Fi, it's really easy to get two days on a charge. Now, if you're, if you're playing Real Racing 3 all day long or using it as a GPS for a nine-hour road trip, you know, you're going to get less battery life. But I mean, in an average mix of use, playing some YouTube videos, checking your email, checking websites, playing a little bit of games, say half an hour gaming, that kind of thing, it's fine. And, and now to demo gaming, this is Real Racing 3, which is a current and pretty demanding game. You're not going to get things like their rear view, mirror view on it, but it's playing pretty smoothly so far. And here we go, zipping right along, trying to pass the competition and it is not bogging down it is not glitching it looks actually pretty good so the snapdragon 400 and adreno 305 you know you can have some fun with this obviously if you're into games if you're a hardcore gamer you probably still want something more but not bad not bad at all and the big screen is really nice for gaming it makes it very easy to see things and once again the screen quality there is pretty good so how about the camera on the back? 13 megapixels, that's pretty nice. No, sorry, you don't get optical image stabilization, which could be handy for something that's kind of like a big barn door, you know? A little wind could actually flap this around outside. But other than that, camera UI, the typical thing here, it uses the full screen. You can swap your front and back cameras. You can control your flash with that button. It obviously has autofocus. It can focus quite close on our fancy iPhone case right there. Quick access to the gallery, switching between photo and video modes. And for more settings, we got sound and shot, we got our HDR mode right there, smart camera mode does its kind of auto thing, panorama, and there's a variety of effects here, beauty shot, and you can do beauty shot for the front camera so people can't see quite how pimply or wrinkly you may or may not be. Focus times are quick, shot times are quick. The result is pretty good. That's, that's not bad looking. That's pretty nice exposure. Very good contrast there. Yeah, some, some shots, especially in low lights, it's sort of like the Samsung Galaxy S5. Low light is not its strong point, even with the flash. You might see some soft detail there or lack of, well, general brightness if it's dark. But in general, something that you couldn't sharpen up if you want to. I think, again, for the $299 price point especially, it's not a bad camera. And 1080p video is pretty decent too. In terms of frame rates, it's consistent pretty much at 30 frames per second. If it's if it's kind of a dark environment, it might drop down into the 20s or so. But yeah, definitely a decent enough camera for the money. How about call quality? Happily, it's very good. Nice and loud and clear. Tested both on AT&T and T-Mobile, both of whom have very good service in our Dallas area. And in terms of the dialing interface, it's pretty generic. You get a big dial pad there. You can access to your recent calls and to your contacts in the background. The usual ability to swap calls over to a Bluetooth headset, that sort of thing. So yes, as a voice phone, it actually does work. Data speeds also are quite respectable. Just the same thing as we would find on a carrier phone, which is a nice thing. And we'll take a look at our speedtest.net so we can check that out and turn off our Wi-Fi. Notice quick access here to your basic settings. So we will turn off our Wi-Fi. And we'll just take a little visit into full settings so you can see what that looks like there. Nothing too unusual going on. And so we'll run our speed test here again. Right now I'm using an AT&T SIM and you can see those download speeds are pretty darn good. That's 
quite pleasant speed right there, faster than a lot of people's home broadband connection. So phone has absolutely no problem with data on U.S. carrier networks, which is ideal. So that's the Huawei Ascended Mate 2. It's available now on GetHuawei.com's website if you're interested in it. Again, it competes sort of with the Samsung Galaxy Megaphone. It's got mid-range specs, a pretty decent display on it. Most important of all, $299 unlocked, pretty darned affordable, really nice phone actually for the price. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.